Hey, how you doing? It's Ronan here. And today I would like to share with you my five favorite passages of Holy Scripture. Now, it's quite difficult to select just five from a canon of about 32,000, but I've narrowed it down to five particular scriptures which speak to me very powerfully indeed and bring me a lot of joy and a lot of peace and rest and comfort. And we're going to look at them um, in no particular order my five favorite passages of holy scripture and we will of course be mentioning various other scriptures along the way also by way of reference the first scripture is from psalm 139 and it's verse 13 you created my inmost being you knit me together in my mother's womb and the following verse verse 14 says i praise you because i am fearfully and wonderfully made and life really really is a miracle uh, today science is revealing to us more and more um, just the rapid changes that take place even in the very early stages of gestation and you had a beating heart just I think about three weeks after you were conceived so life really is a miracle it's uh, intricate it's very precise and uh, we really should be in awe of what the Creator can do and we should praise him because we are fearfully and wonderfully made that's Psalm 139 Our next scripture is Ecclesiastes 9.5, the dead are conscious of nothing at all. I have spent the last 33 years studying the Bible with a magnifying glass and I've read the Bible in English, in Hebrew, in Greek and in Irish and I cannot for the life of me in 33 years, I haven't been able to find a single example where scripture records a person's death and when it's finished recording their death then suddenly as if by magic uh, records a duplicate version of the person without a body in a disembodied state magically appearing either in heaven in God's presence or in some mythological place and the medieval church had all sorts of purgatories and limbos and Dante's infernos and all sorts of underground torture chambers where people could go without a body on the day of their death and yet the Bible doesn't even record one instance of that in 32,000 verses in fact Daniel 12 2 uh, tells us not only what our deceased loved ones are doing but he even tells us where they're doing it Daniel 12 2 says they're sleeping and they're sleeping in the dust of the ground so notice that they're not doing it in heaven they're doing it in the dust of the ground in both testaments rewards and punishments are said to be handed out at the resurrection and that is not the day of your death uh, Luke 14 14 Jesus says you will be rewarded at the resurrection of the just Peter talks about the wicked being reserved for punishment on the day of judgment and that is not the day of their death so uh, there's no consciousness after you die you will not be conscious of anything happening uh, above ground in fact the father of Bible translators William Tyndale put it like this he said when you put the departed into heaven or into any mythological place you destroy the doctrine of the resurrection he actually said destroy the doctrine of the resurrection you cannot be resurrected from your grave unless you're in it and the bible says you will be in your grave that was william tyndale um and the father of the reformation the really the spiritual father of all protestants martin luther um put it even more succinctly he said quite simply he said the dead lie there accounting neither days nor years so there you have really Martin Luther setting down the what I would call the official the official Protestant view of death which is an unconscious slumber in the dust of the ground and um, unfortunately many people identify as Protestants and embrace the medieval I would call it a medieval superstition about going to heaven as a ghost on the day that you die 
or going to some mythological place. But the Bible says the dead are conscious of nothing at all. That's what Solomon says in this verse. And he was writing under the agency of the same Holy Spirit as Daniel, who said that the dead lie in the graves. And he said um, they're sleeping in the dust of the ground. So you will not be aware of anything that's happening above ground after you have died. You will have to wait for the resurrection. There's nothing difficult or complicated about any of this. Um, in fact, four-year-old Jewish children understand this. So there's really no excuse for grown-up Christians. The dead are conscious of nothing at all. Ecclesiastes 9.5 If there is one gospel verse that sums up the Christian faith in a nutshell, then it is possibly John 6.40. This is where Jesus says it is the Father's will that whosoever looks to the Son and believes in him should have something very special. And this is why it's so important to read the Bible in its original languages. Uh, Christianity was never intended to be a standalone European or American religion. It is and always has been a branch of Judaism. Now, tragically, traditional Christianity has been cut loose from its Jewish moorings, but really it is supposed to be a branch of Judaism that's open to anyone regardless of ethnicity, even Paddies. But it is the goal of every Jew for thousands of years to have something called Lechayim Olam. Now, these are two very important Hebrew words. Lechayim is the Hebrew for life and Olam is an adjective and it means during the age. And that is during the age to come when the Jewish Messiah will take up the throne of his ancestor David in Jerusalem. That's Luke 135. And he will sit on that throne and he will reign over Israel and over the world. And to be in that kingdom on the surface of the earth, Matthew 5, 5, it's going to happen on the surface of the earth. Um, that is the goal of every Jew and it ought to be the goal of every Christian as well to have Lechayim Olam. Of course, the New Testament was written in Greek and the corresponding phrase is Zoe Aeonios. Zoe is the Greek for life and Aeonios is an adjective relating to the noun era or epoch or age. Tragically, there is no English equivalent, which is terrible, but it really means to be alive in the age to come. And that should be the goal of every Christian. Now, in the previous chapter in John 5 and in verse 28, Jesus says that he's coming back to the earth and he anticipates finding dead people in their graves. He's not coming back to exhume corpses. He's coming back to resurrect dead people from their graves. And the father of the Reformation, Martin Luther, really, again, the spiritual father of all Protestant Christians, um, describes this event beautifully and evocative, evocatively. Uh, Dr. Luther says this, he says, Christ shall return, knock on the little grave and say, Dr. Martin, get up. I shall suddenly come alive out of the grave and from decomposition and entirely well, fresh with a pure, clear, glorified life, meet my Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. So yet again, you have the spiritual father of all Protestant Christians just setting down the correct biblical, holy, godly way to think about uh, resurrection and the life of the age to come. So that is John 6 and verse 40. I couldn't really nominate five of my favorite Bible verses without including one from the Apostle Paul. So I have selected Philippians 4 and verse 7. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Some translations render it the peace of God, which transcends all understanding. We tend to think of peace as merely the absence of violence. So, for example, I will tell people that my late parents were born between the wars, so between the First and Second World Wars, but the absence of violence is just the absence of violence. The peace to which Paul refers here 
is a divine peace. It's a peace that can only come from God. Now he talks about our hearts and minds. We tend to think of our heart as the seat of our emotions and our mind as the center of our thoughts. And I sometimes picture a kind of spiritual soldier almost standing sentinel over our feelings and over our thoughts. But what's most striking about this verse is that Paul tells us precisely where to go to find this peace, to access this divine peace. And you will not find it in a building. You will not find it in any of the 30,000 denominations that identify as Christian. You will not find it by sitting on a church committee and you will not find it by going on some teenage weekend away how to be a Christian without being a nerd. Um, Paul says you will not find it in a program or in a theological document or even in a book great as the Bible is. Paul tells us that the peace of God which surpasses all understanding and will guard our hearts and minds is found in a person and we have to go to a person to find it and that person is God's own Messiah and only Son Christ Jesus. That has got to be one of the most wonderful promises of God and the same Apostle Paul said that God's promises are not yes and no. He said all his promises, all of his promises are yes in Christ. How comforting is that? Philippians chapter 4 and verse 7. If we are allowed to have an outright favourite Bible verse, then this one would certainly be mine. Revelation 21.4, and to put this verse in context, Messiah has returned to the earth at this stage, has overthrown all of the world's political systems by force, and has assumed his rightful place as king on the throne of his ancestor David in Jerusalem and is reigning over Israel and reigning over the world. And John tells us here that four things are going to be abolished. And those four things are death, mourning, crying and pain. Note very carefully here what John does not say. John does not say that there's going to be some kind of soundproofed torture chamber at the far end of the cosmos where millions and millions of unrepentant sinners will be suffering everlasting pain um, and he doesn't say that here and again this is why it's important to read the bible in its original languages 500 years ago William Tyndale did just that he translated every single verse of the bible into English from its original languages and he couldn't find a single example a single warning um, from God to the unrepentant that gave them any kind of long-term future anywhere in any condition ever and you won't be able to find it either for the simple reason that it isn't there the bible reveals a god of holy justice and not a god of insatiable vengeance everything in the cosmos must be reconciled to god or must be put out of existence now the bible tells us that the unrepentant are going to be punished above ground on the surface of the earth that's proverbs eleven thirty one. so solomon tells us precisely where the unrepentant will be punished it's going to be above ground on the surface of the earth um, peter tells us that the earth is going to melt with fervent heat that's second peter three ten. in fact he tells us that the earth and everything in it will be burnt up um Psalm 68 verse 2 says that um, the wicked will melt like wax in the fire of God's wrath. Um, Psalm 37 verse 20 says they will consume away in smoke. In fact, Peter, Ezekiel and Malachi all use the word ashes. Uh, Ezekiel says in chapter 28, I will turn you to ashes upon the earth and you will never exist again. It's hard to see how he could be more emphatic I'll turn you to ashes upon the earth and you will never exist again. The monstrous doctrine of everlasting conscious torment came into the church in the dark ages. It came into the church when pagans started identifying as Christian. Pagans like Athenagoras, like Tertullian, like Augustine, 
uh, August lads march in, but it is blasphemy to teach that. It is utter blasphemy, that doctrine, and it turns the whole Bible on its head. Uh, the reason there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain is because the old order of things will have passed away and all unrepentant sinners will have been turned to ashes and the old order of things will have passed away. Ashes do not scream. Ashes are simply the byproduct of something that has finished burning. And that's not an opinion. It's not my theology. It's simply a scientific fact. So my favorite verse in the whole Bible, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. Hallelujah for that. Revelation 21 and verse 4.